As always, let's look at the intention and obstacle. John Hammond says that he wants his dinosaur theme park to be a success. He's invested a lot of money into the enterprise and is determined to make it successful even in the face of disaster. In order for this to happen, he needs the approval of external sources. Sadly, the obstacle stopping John from having a successful dinosaur theme park is a lack of understanding and respect for science and nature. This arrogance and ignorance leads the scientists to oppose the park and the eventual realisation that it was never going to work. Will John Hammond's expensive dinosaur-themed theme park gamble pay off despite the lawyer objections? Now that we've established the intention, we can start working on the stakes. Externally, the approval of the park is what's at stake. It's something physical that can be gained or lost. If Hammond isn't able to convince the scientists and the lawyers that his park is a worthy investment, he'll have lost a lot of money. John Hammond mentions how his first attempts at profiting off people's amusements was through a flea circus, but Jurassic Park wasn't going to be animatronics and illusions. It was going to be something real and physical. This is the eternal stake of the story. It's John's attempts to break down a barrier between illusion and reality. He's striving to create something original. Again, the philosophical stakes are mentioned at various points in the story. There's the first thought, as outlined by Dr. Malcolm, that playing God is always a dangerous game. On a similar line of thought, Ellie confronts John over the lack of respect towards the power behind the science and nature of Jurassic Park. There's also the second thought about the greed of Hammond. He repeatedly mentions throughout the film about sparing no expense when it comes to the park's attractions. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And spared no expense. Spared no expense. But when an employee of his wants to argue about pay, John has none of it. The exploitation of the workers at Jurassic Park for profit is the secondary set of philosophical stakes. Now that we have the stakes outlined, we can work out the key beats to see what needs to happen and how we get there. Now that we've moved on to the key beats, we'll start at the beginning. We open on a failed mission to introduce a Velociraptor into Jurassic Park. This results in the death of the creature and, most importantly, a worker. It starts to highlight the dangers the park possesses and the risks employees there are threatened with. It could also be seen as the starting point of the philosophical stakes, but we won't write that down until later on. Next we will move on to the inciting incidents, but instead we'll do the climax. The reason for this is because we need to know what the overarching goal is and what the resolution is going to be. Ultimately, Hammond needs his park to be endorsed by external scientists, which Dr. Alan Grant won't do. Grant says he isn't endorsing Jurassic Park after the proof of its dangers, at which point Hammond agrees. So now we know the end goal, we have to see where this starts. It's when Hammond arrives at a dig site and invites Alan and Ellie to his biological preserve to get his park open. This is Hammond's problem A. Now, as we've seen in previous videos, the second act goal is what needs to be achieved to force the stakes of the main goal. Now, because the main goal isn't a successful one for Hammond, it makes recognising the second act goal a tricky one. Nothing that happens during the second act can persuade anyone to give Hammond a chance to open in the park. Originally, I thought the second act goal was turning the power back on so they could organise an escape from the island, but there isn't really a point in the first act where we can jump back to and say, this is the start of the second act goal, as the power doesn't fail until midway through the film. I'm curious to know anyone else's thoughts on this, so share it with your friends and leave a comment below, but I've identified the second act goal down to seeing what the park and the tour is capable of. The goal starts when the group set off on the guided tour and ultimately ends when Hammond realises that his park is a failure after Ellie tells him that it could never work due to the lack of respect for nature. This realisation for Hammond forces him to understand that the park cannot function as he intends it and now the only thing that matters is getting the power back to the island so that they can escape. So now that we have these five cards laid out, this leaves us with the midpoint. This happens when Dennis sabotages the park system. It creates the setback, as Dennis has been contacted by a rival to steal Hammond's technology, a philosophical setback. It's also an external setback, as the guests are about to experience the full force of the dangers the park possesses, meaning they won't endorse it. There's also a reversal here, as the guests are all initially excited by the prospect of the dinosaur park once the tour starts, despite the lack of dinosaurs. They get to tend to a sick triceratops and the lawyer believes that their investors are going to make a lot of money, but once the flaws behind the park are about to be experienced, it makes everyone question the ethics of the park. So here is the first act. We have our opening, inciting incident and our first act break. So how do we do this? 
After the failed attempt to bring the Velociraptor to Jurassic Park, a lawyer arrives in the Dominican Republic. He mentions there's a $20 million lawsuit against Hammond for the death of the worker. One of the miners says how Hammond hates paperwork slowing everything down. This is where the internal stakes are introduced. The mention of Hammond's lack of concern for the bureaucracy of the Jurassic Park, and he just wants it open as soon as possible. We then see Dr. Grant's managing at a dig site. They've uncovered a Velociraptor fossil. Whilst he explains why dinosaurs share more in common with birds than reptiles, a kid says Velociraptors aren't scary because they sound like a six-foot turkey, as though a six-foot turkey wouldn't actually be terrifying. Dr. Grant explains to the kid about how Velociraptors hunt. This becomes poignant given what happens in a scene later in the film. After scaring the kid with stories of Velociraptors, Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler see a helicopter land at the site. They're told by the pilot that they have a visitor in their caravan. This is where John Hammond invites Grant and Sattler to his biological preserve. It's where the external stakes are introduced and presents the overarching goal of the story, Jurassic Park's endorsement. Next we see Jurassic Park employee Dennis being paid to sabotage the park for arrival. The philosophical stakes are established in this scene as Dennis is going to steal the dinosaurs' viable embryos for this company so they can catch up with Hammond's team's research. It shows that once technology has been developed, people will try and replicate it. If one company with this power is bad, how will a second company one deal with the risks? Dennis is told he needs to get the 15 viable embryos off the island by tomorrow night and he mentions the window of opportunity he has due to his booked system. After this, we're on the helicopter ride to the island. We meet Dr. Malcolm, and he talks about chaos theory and his reservations over the island. There is an obvious clash of personalities between him and Hammond. Once they've landed and taken the cars into the park's grounds, Hammond clashes with the lawyer over the stability and safety of the park. Once the cars come to a halt, this is where the group see the park's dinosaurs for the first time. After the initial awe of what they've seen, the group head to the visitor centre to get a lesson about the science of Jurassic Park. The lawyer asks about the animatronics in the laboratory setting up, so which Hammond quickly shuts down as real and not fake. The group want to see the laboratory and force the ride to stop so they can check out the scientists working on the dinosaurs. The group learn about how they contain and restrict the dinosaurs in the park and their presence when a baby velociraptor hatches. Dr. Malcolm mentions about not containing life to the restrictions Jurassic Park has set. This establishes the secondary set of philosophical stakes about playing God. Because the stakes are in favour of Hammond's views, this is also a threat to the philosophical stakes as it raises the issue of mankind tampering with nature and thinking they can control whatever they create. God controls his creations, surely mankind can do the same. Next up, it's raptor feeding time. Whilst they're at the compound, they speak to the raptor specialist Muldoon, who mentions the threat the raptors pose. Sitting around a table discussing the park and its potential, the lawyer is suddenly in favour of the park whilst everyone else is against it. This is an external threat as Hammond isn't going to get the approval he needs to open the park. Dr. Malcolm also threatens the philosophical stakes too. Next, the group are taken on the guided tour, and this is the first act break, seeing the park in action. Now we've arrived at the second act. In the first half, we need to build up to Dennis's sabotage of the park. So the group have set off on the guided car tour, very early into the tour, the office is told that was a prediction of a tropical storm. Back on the tour, they arrive at the first dinosaur enclosure, but the first dinosaur is a no-show. Back in the office, there's an argument over an issue with the phone lines. Dennis is ganged up on for system issues. Dennis talks about how the work he does should entitle him to more money and no one else could do the job that he does. Hammond won't argue with him over money, and Hammond also mentions that he doesn't blame people for their mistakes, but asks that they pay for them. This is another nod towards the philosophical stakes. Hammond has apparently spared no expense, but won't allow a vital member of the team to have a pay rise. This in turn has forced Dennis to sabotage the park for extra money. The tour has led the group to the T-Rex paddock. The T-Rex is a no-show too. In a bid to lure the T-Rex out of the trees, they send in a goat as bait. This prompts Grant to talk about suppressing instincts and man playing God. Further along in the tour, Malcolm tries to come onto Sattler and explains chaos theory and unpredictability to her. Whilst this conversation is going ahead, Grant and Sattler leave the moving vehicle. This may seem innocuous, but it's exposing the park's flaws. Why don't track cars have locked doors whilst going through a dinosaur enclosure? That's what's important in this scene. After leaving the car, they find a sick triceratops in the field. 
Grant and Sattler are overwhelmed at seeing the dinosaur up close. Back in the office, the decision is made to cut the tow short due to the tropical storm. Hammond isn't happy, highlighting his lack of regard for safety and his impatience to show off the wonder of his park. Sattler stays behind with the Triceratops, whilst the others get back in the cars and head back to the visitor centre. This now splits up the group and puts those returning back into the T-Rex paddock with unlocked car doors. Dennis is told he needs to get the embryos, otherwise his ship is leaving without him. This lands us on our midpoint. Dennis says the systems were all shut down for the time period he needs to collect the embryos, giving him the alibi he needs to step away from his desk. Dinosaurs will run loose, leaving the park unsafe. It highlights its vulnerability and proves that playing God and corporate greed won't pay. And now we're into the second half of the second act. We need to build up to Ellie confronting Hammond over the park's viability and his arrogance in not understanding the real threat the park possesses. Once the realisation of the damage Dennis has done sets in, they try to fix the park system, but they're unable to. After collecting the embryos, Dennis gets lost on his way to the east dock. With the cars now not functioning, the group are stuck outside the T-Rex paddock, and with the electrified fences switched off, the T-Rex escapes its paddock. Hammond's grandkids are trying to get the help of Grant and Malcolm, but actually attract the attention of the T-Rex. This results in the T-Rex attacking the kid's car. With Malcolm distracting the T-Rex into eating the lawyer on the toilet, Dr. Grant tries to save the kids. They end up in the T-Rex paddock, suddenly descending down the 100-foot drop that's just appeared. Everyone at the control centre can't get Jurassic Park back online without Dennis. He crashes his car in his search of the East Dock, and then gets attacked by Dilophosaurus. Another external threat as Jurassic Park is still offline without any sign of it changing. After the T-Rex pushes the car into a tree, Grant climbs the tree and rescues Tim. Back in the office, Hammond sends Sattler and Muldoon to find his grandkids. Once they arrive at the T-Rex paddock, Sattler finds Malcolm. They then exit, pursued by a T-Rex. Despite wandering around the T-Rex paddock, Grant keeps the kids safe for the night whilst hiding up a tree. In the Jurassic Park restaurant, Hammond talks about his reasons for opening Jurassic Park. He's adamant the next one will be better, but Sattler says how she had no respect for the power of Jurassic Park too. This is not only the second act break, but it's an internal setback. Hammond's dreams have been dashed as he didn't fully understand what he was dealing with. It's also the Judas moment of betrayal as Sattler was brought to the island to agree with Hammond over Jurassic Park's potential, but instead she disagrees with it. So once Hammond has had his reality check, the girl is now to leave the island. The morning after the T-Rex attack and the tropical storm, Grant and the kids feed a Brachiosaurus. On their way back to the park, Grant finds hatched eggs. This is a philosophical setback as it goes to show that man cannot control its own creations. Life uh, found a way. In the control centre, there's a disagreement over how to bring the power back. Arnold decides that he has to switch on the circuit breakers manually. Walking back through the open enclosures, Grant and the kids evade a flock of dinosaurs and they see a T-Rex feed. Arnold has been gone for some time and the power still isn't back on. Sattler and Muldoon go out looking for Arnold. Upon walking through the raptor enclosure, they see the raptor fence is broken. Once they're inside the enclosure, Muldoon realises that they're being hunted by raptors. Sattler runs to the circuit breakers. Meanwhile, Grant and the kids have to climb an electrified fence to escape the T-Rex. Sattler turns the power back on, whilst Tim is still on the fence. With the power having been switched back on, Muldoon is still in the enclosure. He's hunted and gets killed by the raptors. Grant then arrives and leaves the kids at the visitor centre. He heads outside where he's reunited with Sattler. Inside, Lex and Tim are treating themselves to the restaurant's buffet. They're rudely interrupted by the raptors and they get trapped in the kitchen by them and have to figure out a way to escape. Once they have escaped, they're taken to the control centre by Grant and Sattler but the raptors aren't far behind and try to gain entry to the control centre. Sattler is unable to fix the door lock and helps Grant keep the door shut. This prompts Lex to fix the system. It's the moment of commitment in the third act as well. There's no going back for Lex now where she has to sort out the system's door locks. After Lex has locked the door, the group escape the control center and wind up in the visitor center. The group are then penned in by raptors. It's the moment of despair in the story as it appears the group are going to get killed off by the raptors. That is until, just like Han Solo in Star Wars, the T-Rex comes crashing through the walls and saves the group. Hammond pulls up in a car outside, 
Grunt gets in and says he is an endorser in Jurassic Park, at which point Hammond agrees. Once again, your final card will read after your climax card, which is everybody escapes the island safely.